Hi, my name is John Flug. I'm the pastor at Windermere Presbyterian Church, and this is the, the video for our study of the Westminster Confession, the second chapter. This video is designed for the elders of our church to help us study through the Westminster Confession, but it's available um, now through YouTube to anyone who's interested. Um, especially our elders, but anyone else, if you have any questions or comments as a result of what we're reading and discussing here, if you'll just include them either in the email I send this out in or in the comments section, I'll try to reply as soon as I can so that we can have a robust, a robust discussion on, on this confession. Um, let's, I hope you have your Bibles and your Westminster Confession. Let's begin by reading um, the Westminster Confession, starting with chapter 2, section 1. This is the the chapter on God and the Holy Trinity. Let's read chapter one or chapter two, section one. There is but one only living and true God who is infinite in being and perfection, a most pure spirit, invisible, without body parts, immutable, immense, eternal, incomprehensible, almighty, most wise, most holy, most free, most absolute, working all things according to his counsel of his own immutable and righteous will, for his own glory, most loving, gracious, merciful, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, and withal most just and terrible in his judgments, hating sin, hating all sin, and who will by no means clear the guilty. So let's talk for a little bit about that first section. This is a first section that begins to outline some of the, the general attributes of God. You heard a, a big long list of all the different attributes of God. And one of the ones that caught my attention, I, I'm interested to know what caught your attention, but one that caught my attention was one of the first ones. It says um, that God is without body parts. You see that? It's about the um, about the third or fourth mention of one of his attributes, without body parts or passions. Without body parts or passions. And that one uh, was interesting to me, so it gave me occasion to look up the Bible verses that are cited to justify that statement in the Creed. The first one makes sense to me. It's Deuteronomy chapter 4. So if you have your Bibles, open them up. Uh, Deuteronomy. I'll flip there myself. Deuteronomy 4, in verses 15 and 16, uh, these verses read this way. So watch yourselves carefully, since you did not see any form on the day the Lord, your spoke, to you, the Lord spoke to you at Oreb, from the midst of the fire, so that you do not act corruptly and make any graven images for yourself in the form of any figure, the likeness of male or female. Of course, the concern here is the, the violation of the second commandment, that you should not make any graven images. And the reason that God gives us that commandment is because he is not limited to the, a particular form um, that we would see in the heavens above, the earth beneath. Um, we, we, we just can't represent God with a form. And so this is the basis behind the second commandment. It's also the basis behind uh, this attribute of God that he is without body parts or passions. Um, but I have a little bit of pause with that in light of the New Testament. And in fact, one of the verses that's cited as a, as a proof for this is Luke 24, 39, which uh, remarkably is one that I would point to to actually raise a question about what this confession is saying. So if you would, let's go to Luke chapter 24, verse 39. <clears throat> Luke 24, 39 is an occasion where Jesus is appearing to his disciples after he's been crucified, raised from the dead. And this is one of the so-called resurrection appearances where he's giving proof that it's him who's been resurrected from the dead. And here's what he says, or let me start up in verse 38. And he said to them, why are you troubled? Why do doubts arise in your hearts? See my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Touch me and see, for a spirit does not have flesh and bones, as you see that I have. So here's where the problem is raised for me. If we are affirming that Jesus Christ is fully God, and that he is raised from the dead, and here demonstrates that he has hands and feet, the Lord himself says this, 
then I'm not I'm not exactly sure I understand or can give you the answer to the this question. Why does this confession then teach us that God is without body parts or passions? Uh, maybe maybe this this creed intends to refer to the eternal uh, the in, in the eternal sense God is without body parts or passions. But we know now the resurrected Christ has body parts because he said to his disciples, "See my hands and my feet." Um, I've thought about this a little bit and tried to reconcile it, and 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 I've come with with two different understandings and in, in the, all the time I've been thinking, and I'm not sure either one of them is really conclusively very helpful. But I just I'm just sharing my thinking with you. One of the options would be I've heard a Christian apologist describe it this way that when Jesus, the second person, the eternal second person in the Trinity, the the, the eternal second person in God in the Godhead. When Jesus is manifested in, in the physical realm, he has a physical manifestation, being that he is human being, and that, and that he, being a human being in the physical realm has a physical manifestation. We all do. We're all humans. We all have these physical bodies. But he argues that in heaven, being a, a spiritual realm, that even though he is still human, there is no physical manifestation of humanity in heaven. Now, I don't know, uh, this is a philosopher, uh, an apologist, uh, uh, forgive me, I can't remember his name, who made this argument, and, and it was an interesting argument to me. I can see where it goes. He, he compared the analysis to, um, to ringing a bell. If you ring a bell uh, in, in just everyday life, you hear the sound of the bell, and you hear the sound of the bell because the, be the sound travels through the air and reaches our ears. On the other hand, there is if you were to be inside of a vacuum and ring that bell, you would not hear it because there are no sound, there are no, um, there's no space to carry the the sound, um, and so it doesn't mean that there's not a sound being made. It just means that there's no manifestation of that sound. Um, interesting, interesting thought, interesting idea to say that. Just because Jesus is in doesn't have a physical manifestation in heaven doesn't mean that he's not still human. Uh, that could be the case. I think it's sort of a a weak case. I don't know. I don't see a whole lot of scriptural evidence for that. Uh, I think that what we're seeing here is that Jesus Christ, resurrected from the dead, seated at the right hand of the Father, has hands and feet. That's what he showed his disciples. But again, that still leaves us scratching our head with the, regard to this confession. How, what does it mean then that it says God has, is without body parts or passions? Um, the other option is this. Either the confession errs in this. Um, it is possible for the confession, which is a man-made document, to be an error. It is not possible for the Bible, a God-breathed and, and, and God-inspired and written document, it's impossible for the Bible to err. So it could be, if I'm interpreting the Bible correctly and understanding the Westminster Confession correctly, it could be that the Westminster Confession has erred here. Uh, it could also be that there's a piece I'm missing, and, and I, it's just due to not necessarily an error in the Westminster Confession, but an error in my ability to understand what's being said. I don't know. I don't know. I'm interested to hear what you have to say. Um, anyway, let's continue. Um, the, one of the, the next attribute that really sort of got me excited was this attribute a little bit a little way more ways through the list most free god is almighty most free most holy most uh most, most holy most free most free is the one that is interesting to me and if we think about freedom what it means to say free we like to say well we are free um but really even as we talk about political freedom our ability as human beings to be politically free or free in the midst of a society of people even that freedom if when we really push comes to shove, we understand that that freedom is a limited freedom, and it only exists inside of certain contexts. For instance, if I were absolutely free, it would mean that I could kill you, or take you prisoner, or steal your stuff, and, and there's nothing that you would be able to do to stop me, because I am free. You can't stop my freedom from me doing whatever I, whatever I really want to do. But what we say is that within a society, we limit people's freedoms to a, a certain point, I think that arguably our, we would say that historically our point has been your freedoms end where my freedoms begin. And so the, you, there's this sort of, you can't take away someone else, you can't use your freedom to take away someone else's freedom. That's where your freedom begins. And so it's a limited sort of freedom that we have. We understand that 
when we're talking about freedoms, we're not talking about freedoms in an absolute sense when it comes to human beings. Humans always have a, a freedom that's curtailed or limited by various factors. Um, so it, it's, it's really not fair for us in any context to say that we have an absolute freedom. I mean, if nothing else, think about this. The context that you're, the things that affect most the way you live your life are the family that you're born into and the, the economic and, and uh, social, polit po social political context you're born into. And those are things that you don't choose. You're born into those. And they largely shape the way the rest of your life goes. And so that was not a free choice you made to be born into the particular family that you were born into, to be born into the time and place that you were born into. But those are the two biggest factors in shaping your life. So we understand that freedom is um, probably largely overrated in our own minds as far as how much of it we actually have. But there is a being that has absolute freedom, that being, being God. He is most free, as this confession says. And so I, I want to read the verse that backs that up. That's Psalm 115, verse 3. If you have your Bibles, turn there with me. Psalm 115, verse 3, and um, there in 115, verse 3, it's stated quite plainly, but our God is in the heavens and he does whatever he pleases. And so it is important for us to keep in mind when we're talking about our freedom, that our freedom is always Subject, subject to the freedom of God. There is no freedom that exists outside of God's freedom. In other words, we're not going to make a free choice that goes beyond what God has already freely chosen for us. People say, well, do you really believe in, in freedom and free choice? I said, I only believe that there's one free choice and that's God's free choice. And that's in, in, in the most absolute sense, that's true. There's only one free chooser and that's God. Okay, um, last aspect of this first section I want to look at uh, comes at the end, and it says this, the last line or so of the section of chapter 2. Um, and with all, most just and terrible in his judgments, hating all sin, and will by no means clear the guilty this is an interesting line because so often in our uh, modern Western world, we like to characterize God as this all loving, and he is all loving, but we like to characterize him as though that's his only attribute. And this last line reminds us that God hates sin, that we will not clear the guilty, that there is an aspect of God that is furious with our sin and with our rebellion. Yes, God is loving, but part of the aspect, part of hate, part of loving is hating. I think if you love something, if you really love something, then you hate the very thing that would destroy that which you love. And that's exactly what we see with God, that God loves his people as he has created them to be holy and righteous and just. And what is it that destroys the holiness and justice and righteousness of his people? It's sin. God hates sin. And those who persist in it, even after, even especially after he gives his free offering of grace in Jesus Christ, those who persist in sin, God, God hates those and will not clear the wicked uh, who persist in destroying what he loves. Um, and so I think we have to remember that, that the justice of God is certainly an aspect of his characteristics as well. Okay, let's read section two in, um, in chapter two of the Westminster Confession. Here we go. God hath all life, glory, goodness, blessedness in and of himself and is alone and unto himself all sufficient, not standing in need of any creatures which he, which he hath made, nor deriving any glory from them, but only manifesting his own glory in, by, unto, and upon them. He is the alone foundation of all being, of whom, through whom, and to whom are all things, and hath most sovereign dominion over them, to do by them, for them, or upon them, whatsoever he himself pleaseth. In his sight all things are open and manifest. His knowledge is infinite, infallible, and independent upon the creature, 
So as nothing is to him contingent or uncertain, he is most holy in all his counsels, in all his works, in all his commands. To him is due from angels and men and every other creature whatsoever worship, service, or obedience he is pleased to require of them. Uh, this is the second section of, of our um, chapter on the attributes of God. And uh, I want to begin with this one that he said that it says in this confession that he is not deriving any glory from them, that is us, uh, his creatures. He does not derive any glory from them. That may be sort of a shocking thing for us to hear, but it is true, and it's an important lesson for us to learn that God does not derive any glory from us sinful, broken creatures, none. He's not glorified by us. At all. At all. And um, in order to show that, the, the, the Westminster Confession gives us Acts chapter 17, verses 4 to 5. So let's go there. Acts 17, verses 4 to 5. Acts chapter 17, verses 4 to 5. Oh, I'm sorry. It's Acts 17, verses 24 and 25. <laughs> I, was, I was a little lost for a second. Listen, Acts 17, Acts 17, verses 24 and 25. This is Paul when he's speaking to um, the crowd gathered at Mars Hill, the, the crowd that worships all sorts of different gods. And here's what he says. The God who made the world and all things in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made with hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all people life and breath and all things. In other words, God is not going to gain anything from us serving him. God doesn't need anything from us. We cannot offer anything to God that he needs or wants. We have nothing in ourselves to offer to God. You say, well, then what's the, what's the point, right? If we can't bring anything or do anything or offer God anything that he actually wants, what's the point of our whole existence? Well, there's also an interesting little part of this Westminster Confession that helps us understand that. At, right after it says that um, uh, he's not in need of any creatures which he hath made, nor deriving any glory from them. That's what we just talked about. Look what it says next. But only manifesting his own glory in, by, unto, and upon them. What God gains from his creatures is that he gets to manifest his own glory in them. And then that glory reflects back to him. What God is pleased with is the fact that we can serve as, a, as an appropriate echo of his own glory. What can be greater for, for us to be able to do than reflect back the, God's own glory to himself. What we would offer would be far less. We couldn't, we can't come close to the glory of God, but God in his, in his mercy and his grace has given us this great privilege of being able to be reflectors, reflectors of his own glory, to take what he shines on us and reflect that back to him, that we would be an echo of his own glory. Um, and, and that's the highest sort of calling that we could possibly have. Um, and so I, I heard an interesting illustration sometimes back that, uh, I mean, it, you, you'll all recognize it, that when you look up in the night sky and you see the moon, a full moon, it's bright and it's shining up, lighting up the whole evening where you can see the, the roads clearly, you could walk um, very easily because the moon is just brighting, lighting things up. Are you walking indeed by the light of the moon? That's what we call it, the light of the moon, but it's not really the moon's light, is it? What you're walking by is a reflection of the sun's light. All the moon can do, the moon has generates no light in and of itself. The moon has no light that belongs to it properly, but it is so beautiful because it reflects the sun's light. Reflects the sun's light. And this is, this is what we're called to do too. We're called to be reflections 
of the glory of God, not to generate glory in and of and through ourselves. We're not supposed to try and become these great people so that everyone will say, wow, John, what a great person you are. You're so morally good. You're so, you're so great at this and you're so good at that. I, that. That's not what our goal should be. Our goal should be to take what God has given us and reflect as clearly as we can his own glory back into the world and in worship back up to him. We're also reminded that this is true of our creeds. Our creeds, even the Westminster Confession that we're reading today, our creeds have no authority, wisdom, or guidance in and of themselves. They are man-made documents, and if they were only man-made documents that did nothing except express the wisdom of man, then they would be darkness. But what we say is that the creeds give off a certain light, not because they have light in and of themselves, but the creeds reflect the light that's given to us in the scriptures. This, they reflect the light of the scriptures to us. That's why the creeds are valuable. Okay, before we move on to the last section, I, there's one more aspect of this, um, the second section I want to bring up. It says that nothing to him is contingent or uncertain. That is, nothing to God is up in the air. Nothing to God in all of human history is a question or a surprise. It's all settled. Tomorrow, for God is as settled as yesterday. Nothing is contingent. Nothing is a surprise. Nothing is a worry to God. He knows every aspect of human history, and he knows every aspect of your life and mine, even before it happens. A couple of verses that um, I'll bring out. One, for us personally, is Psalm 139. Um, I quote this a lot. It's my favorite. It's probably my favorite. It is. It's my favorite Psalm, Psalm 139. And out of the verses in Psalm 139, verse 16 is my favorite. And so Psalm 139, verse 16 is where I want to take you today. Psalm 139 and verse 16. Here's what it says. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. And in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me, when as yet... Not one of them existed. Before any of our days existed, God had every one of them written out. Knew everything that we would do. One of the great reliefs, I know some people say, well, this just seems sort of fatalistic. But it shouldn't. It should be a great relief for us. One of the reliefs for us is this, that when we when we screw up, when we, when we sin, when things don't go the way that we anticipated it, we can always count on this. God knew this was going to happen. God made provision for this even before I knew that I needed provision for this. God's plan for all these aspects is certain and written and taken care of and handled well in advance. But it's not just our lives that God has taken care of. Think of all the billions of people on the earth. God's done that for every one of their lives. But it's also true for all of human history. So if you go with me to Isaiah 46, verses 9 to 11. Isaiah 46, 9 to 11. Isaiah 46, 9 to 11, remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, the things that have not been done, saying my promise will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a far country. Truly, I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have planned it. Surely, I will do it. Listen, oh, and, then, and that's where we'll end it. That God, from, God planned the end from the beginning. All human history, from before it started, before the foundation of the world, until the very last Amen of Revelation, we, God has every aspect of it planned out and handled. What we're watching in, in real time, in, in our own lives, is not something uncertain, but the unfolding of God's definite plan. And, um, and we should rest in that, that God has this as a plan um, that he's always had from the beginning. Okay, last aspect we're going to look at is, uh, or last section we're going to look at is Westminster Confession, chapter 2, um, beginning in the the 
third section, the third and final section. In the unity of the Godhead, there be three persons of one substance, power, and eternity. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. The Father is of none, neither begotten nor preceding. The Son is eternally begotten of the Father. The Holy Ghost is eternally preceding from the Father and the Son. Now we're, now we're stepping into the mystery. The, uh, we're going to do our very best to put words around what is ultimately unexplainable, and that is the Trinity of God. Um, it's one of the most important, one of the most central, and yet one of the most difficult concepts for Christians to explain. Um, but we'll, we'll do our best to put some words to it and, and talk about how the Westminster Confession puts words to this belief. Um, if you're looking for a biblical reference, what I might suggest, and what I will suggest, is John chapter 14. John 14 is one of the most, one of the clearest examples of what we would call Trinitarian doctrine. People say, might argue with you, and they'd say, well, the Trinity is not in the Bible. Well, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but the teaching of the Trinity certainly is. Jesus teaches Trinity when he when you read through John 14. And so if you're talking with someone who says, I don't necessarily believe, I believe in the Bible, but I don't believe in the Trinity, we'll say, well, do you believe in John 14? What Jesus teaches there, and if they say yes, then you say, well, we're on the same page, because that's what we believe too. We just put a, a, a name to it, uh, and we call that name Trinity, that God is three persons in one Godhead, that there's not three gods, there's only one God, but that that one God is not existent in simply one person. He's existent in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we've got a couple of attributes that apply to all three of the persons of the Godhead. All three, Father and Son and Spirit, are all same in substance, meaning that whatever, it's hard to put words on this, but the usia is the, the word that was used in the early church as they were describing this from the Greek. Uh, whatever usia or substance or stuff that the Father is made of, that same usia or substance or stuff, the essential essence is the same thing that is of the Spirit and the same thing that is of the Son. They are all of the same essential essence, the same usia, the same stuff. And so they're all of the same substance. They're all of the same power. In other words, the Father is not more powerful than the Son. The Son is not more powerful than the Spirit. The Spirit is not more powerful than the Father. They, they all have the same. They're all equal in substance. They're all equal in almighty power. Look at that. They're all equal in substance, all equal in power, all equal in eternity. We're going to start to talk about some of the differences here, and this is going to get a little crazy because we like to think in linear fashion, in chronological fashion, but we have to understand that as long as the Father has existed, which he's always existed from all from eternity, as long as that's been the case, that the Father has existed, so has the Son existed, so has the Spirit existed. There's never been a time when there was just the Father. And then finally the Son and then the Spirit. We talk about them in, in terms of begotten and proceeding, but those are not, we're not talking, we're not making reference to time. We're not re making reference to chronology. We're talking about in reference to um, relationality to each other. But in, ter in terms of chronology, in terms of time, if we can talk about God in that way, as long as God has existed, so has the Son, so has the Spirit, they are all three eternal. From the very beginning to the very end, um, they all have existed the same. Now, what are some? So, if those things are, are true of the one God, the one God shares in the same substance, power, and eternity. Now, what are the distinctions between the persons? Well, the, the main distinctions are these: that the Father is neither begotten nor proceeding. Begotten is a is a weird, sort of interesting way to describe something. Um, begotten means coming coming as a result of the existence of another thing. Um, sometimes, sometimes scripture refers to this as giving birth to, although it doesn't refer exclusively to this. It can come generated out of. That, maybe that's the best way to describe begotten, to be generated out of the other thing. And so we think about the son, he is begotten of the father. He is generated out of the father. But it, again, it's not in chronology, not in times, terms of time. There wasn't a point when this happened. This has always happened. It's like, as long as you have been alive, as long as you have been alive, you have always had a conception of yourself, right? M maybe that conception of yourself was very rudimentary early on. You, you only conceived of yourself as uh, being hungry, or you only conceived of yourself as being 
um, tired or needing a diaper change, whatever it was when you were a baby. But as you evolved, as you grew, your thinking of yourself changed too. You're able to be aware of yourself, almost step outside yourself and reflect on yourself. But as long as you've existed, you've been aware of yourself. Well, the begottenness of God is that as long as God has existed and he's eternally existed, he's always been aware of himself. Now, unlike us, he never had to progress. He's always had a perfect understanding of himself. And so that perfect under, you might even argue that the second person of the Trinity is in, in some ways this. Jonathan Edwards made a similar sort of argument that, that the, the second person of the Trinity, the begotten of God, is God's understanding of God's self so perfectly manifested that it is in and of itself a second person. Well then, so that's what it means to be begotten of. But then what does it mean to proceed? Procession is actually the action taken. And so the action taken of the Father and of the Son is when they realize that they, that, they, that they recognize each other as existing mutually, eternally, one begotten of the other, then they love each other. And that action, that, that active action is so real that it becomes in and of itself um, a, a third per a yet a third person, arguably. Um, this is, again, Jonathan Edwards' line of reasoning, that that would be the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> so there's the Father, unbegotten, not proceeding, there's the Son who's begotten of the Father eternally, and then there's the Spirit who is eternally proceeding from the Father and from the Son. Um, and so we, we have three different persons and yet still yet but one God. Um, there's, a, there, there's an ancient church creed called the Athanasian Creed. It came shortly after the Apostles' Creed, I mean not the Apostles, the Nicene Creed, to help clarify some of the issues around Trinity. And there's a helpful graphic that I'll show you here that... Um, that uh, helps to people to think about the Father and the Son and the, oh, the Holy Spirit. Let me make sure I got this right. Okay, you see there, you've got the, the Father, who is God. You see the, the words between the Father and God is is. The word between the Holy Spirit and God is is. The word between God the Son and God is is. But the words between the Son and the Spirit and the Spirit and the Father and the Father and the Son is is not. That's because we can rightly say the Father is God. But the Father is not the Son, and the Father is not the Holy Spirit. The Son is God, but the Son is not the Father, and the Son is not the Spirit. The Spirit is God, but the Spirit is not the Father, and is not the Son. And yet we have but one God. Um, and so, again, we're trying to attach human descriptors to what is infinite, eternal, and ultimately undescribable. It's why we call the, the Trinity the mystery of the Trinity. Um, but we can say some things that are certainly true, and I believe that we have said some things that are true about the triune nature of God. Okay, well that concludes this section of uh, our looking and our studying of the second chapter of the Westminster Confession. If you have, again, if you have any questions, email me or put them in the comments below. Let me close us in prayer. God, thank you for the Westminster Confession for the way that it helps us to dive deeper into your word and helps us have a, a more systematic and comprehensive understanding of your word. Help us to uh, remember that it is but like the light of the moon, that we are looking at, at the moon because sometimes the light is too bright for us to look directly at, but it helps us understand more about you. Remind us and draw us always into Christ and always into your word, finally and ultimately. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all. Bye.